get us started. Um, we have a great day today planned, and we will um, have a great dinner after. A couple of announcements to start. Um, groups had to be kind of mixed up because some people dropped, some people added. We needed to move people around. The lists are posted in the back, but Bridget is also scrolling through the small groups right now. So if you find your name and find your TA, you can find your table. Questions on TA groups? Hopefully everyone who's enrolled is assigned a TA group, so I think we're good with that. Um, when, we get, when we finish class at quarter of and go upstairs, Sit down in your group and we will call, we'll just go up and down calling groups to go get their food. It doesn't make sense for 115 or 120 people to stand in line when you could be using that time for introductions. So sit down in your group and then we'll go through just like in church, this aisle, this aisle, this aisle, this aisle, this aisle. Make sense? Questions? Cool. All right. We've been through a few times. Okay, cool. So you could shut that down. Um, so we're at the second food class, and Charlie is going to introduce our guests. I have a brief note to read from Dean Patton, who is sick, and I'm Kathy Rudy, the other co-teacher. Welcome back, and I'm sorry that I cannot be there with you today. I am down with the flu, which we can fairly much guarantee is locally grown, but probably not in the way you will be discussing today. Last week we gave you parameters of the class and the ways in which we need to talk together as a university community about food, an issue of common concern, where we ask, as Charlie Thompson reminded us, how did this food get to this table? What are the social, economic, and natural forces that create the food environment we live in today? Today we are giving you one answer to that question in the local food movement. We know all of these presenters to be critical thinkers and actors at the same time and to have been transformed by the idea of place and the power of food grown in a single place. In addition, this is again Dean Patton speaking, I listened to you as you introduced yourselves to each other during the last class and I was amazed at the diversity and the commitment in the room. We have people who grew up on horse farms, people who are PhD students in genetics, people who have always grown up with their own garden, people who are critics of the local food movement. Sorry, thanks. Um, and it struck me that I left something out of my last lecture. How's that, Heather? Oh, is this actually on? Oh, okay, great. Um, <laughs> and it struck me that I left, left something out of the last lecture. I mentioned last time my idea of a pedagogical commons, that faculty would share expertise beyond our usual expectations. But it occurred to me after listening to you all that students too are key players in helping us build the pedagogical commons around food. You will help us understand the ways in which our individual student expertise can teach and shape the common good. I know Kathy and Charlie will catch me up, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all next week. All the best, the Dean with the sneezes. And that's actually how she signed it. Um, so I'll turn it over to Charlie, who will introduce our speakers today, and hope you enjoy. <laughs> well, they were clapping for me. <laughs> no, you don't have to clap for any of us. Um, welcome, everybody. I see some good colleagues in the back who are uh, uh, supportive of this food movement that we have going here, and that's really what we're talking about today is, uh, is local food, and there's no more important place to talk about local food than in your backyard and where we live and so forth, and that's part of the, the uh, goal today. And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing friends who I've known in different ways for, the, for years, and um, we're going to hear from folks who are at work in Durham and at Duke. The first speaker will be Dr. Dennis Clements, who is the, as it's listed here, the board president of SEEDS. It's great that that's how it starts out. 
seeds the organization in Durham that has done so much work in, the, in, uh, in downtown Durham with children in, in uh, eastern Durham with gardening. And I, I love these kids. I've seen them on an, a number of different occasions, uh, have been a panel chair with, with teenagers who are 15 and 16-year-olds who, who are writing op-ed pieces in the newspapers about food issues. They have come so far because of this organization. And then they have the very little ones called seedlings that uh, are as cute as as cucumbers. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, but back to the rest of what Dennis Clements does, he's, it seems like there should be about five names, five different people, because he's, he's so many things. Professor of Pediatrics, Professor in the School of Nursing, Professor in Community and Family Medicine, Professor of Medicine, Chief of the Division of Primary Care of Pediatrics, he has done vaccine research on infectious disease, epidemiology, cost effectiveness of vaccination strategies. Where we have worked together is that he works on Latino health issues. He's worked in Latin America as well. We are on the Latin American uh, Studies Council together. That's, and he's been the chair of that council for years. Um, he also works in healthcare delivery systems, health manpower, person power, needs in the third world. And I have a, another friend who's a physician who, um, who actually stopped working in the clinic and became a farmer. And I think that, that uh, Dennis would be, would be sympathetic with that. Some of you know who he is. He, um, he, be, he believed that his best work on, on promoting health was in promoting agriculture and small farms and local sales and farmers markets. Responding to uh, Dennis Clements is someone whose name you've probably seen on the fitness center on East Campus, Brenda Brody, yes, that same one, um, who was the founder of seeds the organization. And as I think about her, um, about her life story, it's amazing what, what causes someone to, to change his or her life and to go into building an organization. How does that work? Well, in, in this bio, some, some of that's there. First of all, she gardened with her great-grandmother, grandmother, parents and her own children. She has been a lifelong gardener with multi-generations of people working together. She says, once we got settled in Durham, I began dreaming about gardening and started developing some goals, she says. First, she started working at the Sarah Duke Gardens. She became an active member of several boards of organizations working on agriculture and so forth. She says, I saw many people, especially kids, disconnected from nature and the food we eat. I knew gardens could be much more than just places of beauty. They could transform personal lives and communities. I wanted to change the public's perception of eating and growing food. Then she, after reading an article in the National Geographic about this Philadelphia Green Movement, she and her and a friend's daughter actually just decided in 1994 they were going to start an organization, Southeastern Efforts Developing Sustainable Spaces, and that became SEEDS. She'll be responding to Dennis Clements and his uh, work, and they have worked together, which is great. Emily Sloss will then come last with a uh, recent Duke's student perspective. She majored in public policy and uh, while here worked with, with Charlotte Clark who's in the back and others of us and she did a certificate in documentary studies and um, she comes from Jupiter, Florida where I have, I've 
I've been, and there are lots and lots of uh, farm workers in that community, recent immigrants. I made a film about that, and that's how I got to know Emily. One day she said, I hear you're making a film about that. Is there any way I can help? And she actually um, ended up shooting some of the film that made it into the final cut. Um, but the most, her real claim to fame, and the reason that she's here is as she, uh, as she was in her senior year, she and a group of other students began to think about what about the possibility of having our own backyard here at Duke transformed into an agricultural space. How can we grow food in an, in an academic <laughs> environment? And they started looking at other places, Yale and so forth, that had done that. And some of us were on the board, uh, advisory board, uh, I work with Brenda on that, and we started saying, well, that might be a good idea, and we'll start working on this, and years to come, it, it'll happen. Well, about six months later, there was already a crop to be harvested, <laughs> much to our surprise and joy. They, being energetic and, and not taking no for an answer, began to build this farm out in some territory owned by Duke Forest, and it's right across from the Friends School. They'll tell you more about it. And some of the food that we'll eat tonight will be from that Duke Farm. And so this, this threesome here will tell us about how they've worked to transform your environment into a uh, an environment that includes eating and food, and it's not just a garden to look at, but a garden to, to be nourished from. So, Dennis, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I have to admit to being um, somebody who likes food. I counted my cookbooks at home last night. And I have 138 cookbooks. Um, but this is the cookbook everybody needs. This, this book was first written in 1931, before we had TV dinners. And anything you want to know about food is going to be in here. Now, the other cookbooks can help you make the, the food a little more interesting, etc. cetera. Uh, and there's lots of reasons to have other cookbooks. But if you want to know how many calories there is in something, uh, et cetera, well, where did that piece of meat come from on a cow? Uh, anything you want to know. How many calories in pig's knuckles? Uh, probably something you haven't thought about. Um, but it's all in here. Um, Locavore is a new term, uh, first created in 1997 or, or uh, 2007. I think it became actually a word. But you know, most of the places I go in the world, everybody's a locavore. When I go to Honduras, you know, it, people are locavores. When I grew up, when I was a kid, I was a locavore. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm getting hold of the delay here. And this is what food is all about. Food, food is about community and people and relationships. Um, I see one of the ladies here is pregnant. What, what if you just sort of ordered your baby, you know, and it, you sort of went to the store and picked it up, this little saran thing, you know, and you took it home. I mean, you should be as intimate with your food and what it tastes like because it's as important to you as that baby. I mean, you may live or die on what you put in your mouth. And um, we just go to the store and trust whoever puts something in a box too frequently. That, that was um, down at the beach. It's called Shea Fish. Guess what they serve? Okay? And it's at the beach and it's fish from the sea there. This is in Maine. These people have picked up lobsters in Maine. And they're sitting down. Uh, there's a river there, you can see. And while they were sitting there, two bald eagles flew over our heads. I mean, I was so paralyzed, I did not get the picture. Because uh, they're, they're silent. They just swoop down. And uh, this is what food's about. Community. This is uh, also at the beach. What does it take for muscles? 
and a few peppers. Uh, and amazing, amazing the pressure recently has even pushed Harris Teeter to have a section that is local or regional. So there is more and more pressure, thanks to all of you in this room and others, to have food that is closer to home. Now, this is hard to see with all these lights. I don't know if there's a way to do that. I don't know where it is. But at any rate, I can, this, you can do, because I can do this. This is, this is crab, crab cakes. Those are potatoes from my yard. Uh, these, I, didn't, I don't have eggs like Brenda does. I could have borrowed an egg from Brenda, and I could have made, uh, made that. Um, but this is what you can do with food and enjoy what you're doing. This is my garden. Uh, I have 10 raised beds, maybe 400 square feet. Um, you can see this is the winter, obviously. Over here is where all the okra is. Uh, for those of you, if you grow your own okra, you will learn to like okra. Most, most people don't, so they don't know. The asparagus is in the back. Um, asparagus is a great plant because you can't, it's not instant food. You have to prepare the soil and you have to wait. But there is nothing better. You can eat it raw after you break it off in the garden. It is delicious. Um, the frost got some of my lettuce recently. But other lettuce is doing just fine. Um, this is the uh, broccoli. Down there is the collards. Uh, it, how many people in here eat collards or kale? Great. It is one of those are two of the best foods in the world for everything you need. And I, if you don't know how to cook it, I'm going to show you here in a second what I did with it. These are these are my sweet potatoes. They don't look exactly like the ones in the store because these haven't been manufactured in the same way. These grew in real ground, uh, and there's nothing better than a real sweet potato. What's that? Collards. All right. And that's, that's for my yard. And this is what I made. Made my own bread, whole wheat bread up there. That's goat cheese with a little tomato and uh, basil. These are the collards. Just boil them up. Add a little red wine vinegar and salt. That's all you got to do. Nothing else. It's delicious. And uh, in here, who, who's made their own pasta? Excellent. There is nothing better than your own pasta. And the only thing you have to remember is you don't have to cook it forever like the stuff you buy in the store that's made to be shipped to, you know, Saudi Arabia. I mean, the stuff you make will be cooked in two minutes. And along with it is some Angus beef from the market uh, and some uh, mushrooms. And if you want beans, <laughs> when I go to Honduras, there's plenty of beans. This is all local food, all of this that you've seen. And if you want pig, that is a pig in Honduras. I mean, I swear that pig was in the backyard yesterday and is here today. Um, and is not receiving any of the stuff that, you know, a lot of animals in the United States receive. But this is what's happened. Well, I showed you what, to me, food is. This, is. this happened in about the 60s, where this became fast food. Uh, and not only did we lose the connection with food, but we lost the connection with people that goes with having food. Um, and inside, there's lots of selections, and they're relatively cheap. That's the thing. Where, do, where does McDonald's make its, food, where make its money? Drinks. It's all on the drinks. They don't make any money on their food. They may lose money on their food. But if you look at their Coke or anything else you buy, it's about 10 cents of Coke, real product in that thing that they're charging you $1.50 to four. So all their money's made on the Coke, which is why they put the salt, extra salt in all the food, so you'll have more Coke. Uh, plus, I mean, do you get a Coke even that small? No, you get something, you know, the size of Texas, right? So now this is the American breakfast. Have we lost something from those first pictures I showed you to this? I think so. I mean, the computer's not nearly as good a friend as all those people you saw around my table. And the thing I'll, I'll give you is this floor is clean. But there's nothing on there that hasn't been manufactured specifically for taste for you to buy. And while it's not fair to say that it's like being a drug pusher, but a drug pusher doesn't care 
how you do after they sell you the product. They're just making a product. And it's not fair to say that about this, but I'm not sure the same interest has gone into when these things go on the shelf to help you, uh, or this. There's the nabs and everything over here. Um, yes, they'll satisfy a little you know, need for, for glucose for a moment, but not for very long. And Michael Pollan says, if any of you want to just Google some of his YouTube stuff, it's great. You could just, you know, watch forever. He says, don't fuel your car and yourself at the same place. <laughs> uh, so, you remember that one? Did you ever see that one? Yeah. Okay. Um, and even in Honduras, it takes me, when I go to this place, this is a place with no electricity. Most of the time, the water runs. Um, and it's the back of nowhere. But you can get soft drinks, and you can get all kinds of stuff to eat, you know, that uh, basically has no flavor. I am sitting there eating nothing but vegetables every meal from these people that have pulled them out of their yards from everywhere. And the kids are going here. There's this attraction that people seem to have that they can't suppress to go to this fast food like it's better or something. I don't know. I mean, you know. I mean, I see it in my office. I still see, see patients. And the kids will be there eating goldfish, you know, which when I grew up, they were in the water. Uh, all right, so for very briefly, I'm not sure if you're going to get any medical aspect of this, but the overweight trends in countries, this is from 1970 to 2020, over 50 years projected, uh, overweight is over 25. BMI over 25, from 40 to basically 70, almost doubling in the United States. And along with that, things like diabetes going up. This is a much shorter period. This is only 10 years, uh, but the curve is basically the same. Now, this is actually a scheme, schematic, of somebody from the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene who has a person in the middle and all of the things around you that determine how, whether you're overweight or not, which not only includes food consumption, but the production and all the advertising, societal influences that go along with it. That is what you're really combating most of the time when you go out and try to educate someone. Because what they've seen on TV, and you know, you know that commercials can be louder than the regular program. It drives me crazy. Um, and, but that's what they're pushing. Plus all the individual activity environment. When I was a kid, we had no air conditioning. We came home, mom said hi, she locked the screen door, said I'll call you for dinner. And I mean, you just got by as best you could doing whatever you were doing. Now they come in, they sit down, they have a Coke or they have some nabs and they do something on the TV, on the computer. And the health consequences of obesity. Everybody knows these, these are in the paper all the time. And just as a projection for 2011, for the world, I mean, even places you would never guess where diabetes is, it is now. Um, and a lot of these people aren't particularly overweight, like we think about in some of these countries. But it's really an epidemic. And if you look at India or China, where the U.S. population is 20% of their population. When they've got a problem with obesity or something, they've got a real problem. There's a lot of people uh, with heart disease. These are projections for obesity for girls aged 2 to 11 over the next, uh, that's up to um, 2049. Yeah. So, you know, who knows where these curves will go. But we, we can try to stop it now. But if not, that's where the projection is. And just to give you, given the cost to individuals, payers, and employers, the total cost is 400, in the United States, is $450 billion a year. The budget for defense is $863 billion. The budget for health is about $700 billion. Uh, the budget for Social Security is about $700 billion. So this is right up there, the cost of being obese in the United States with all those budgets. This is really from one of Michael Poland's talks that basically in 1900 there were cooks in the kitchen. Everyone was a local boar at that time. 1920, frozen food appears. There weren't any restaurant chains. 
1930, the improvement in the highways is one of the things that changed what happens with food because they could actually get it somewhere in a hurry. In 1950, cows, they learned that they could grow, instead of having to pasture them and have them roaming everywhere, they could put them in a, in a room and just feed them soy and corn and they'd, they'd produce milk or you could grow them uh, so you could use them uh, for beef. TV and TV dinners became popular. I'm going to show you that in the next slide in 1954 by Swanson. 1970, in California, the organic movement began as a pushback on all of these things. Um, and when more women entered the workforce, not that it's fair or it should, like you know, I say, I like to cook. Uh, in fact, I, I'm happy to cook for my wife. Uh, but mostly it's women that have been cooking as they entered the workforce. The idea of a TV dinner or something quick, uh, you know, that that was a that sounded good to them. 1980 meat consumption skyrocketed. Uh, in the last 50 years, the population's doubled, and the meat consumption's gone up five times. The average person's supposed to eat about eight ounces of uh, meat of some kind in a week, just the average, and we eat on average about that quantity every day in the United States. That doesn't mean you are, but on average. Um, and in 2000, the expansion of local food and slow food, why do they call it slow food? Because it's not fast. It's a reaction against the fast food. It's slow down, relax, enjoy your food. So this, if you know one who's seen it, and there are some of you in this room, I know who's seen this. Um, this is a Swanson TV dinner. And you picked them up, and they used um, trays from the, um, from the airlines, and uh, why did they do it? Because they had 270 tons of leftover turkey one Thanksgiving, and they were on these refrigerated trains, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they created, they, some, some bright spark said, hey, look, how about we just cut it up and put it on one of these trays, freeze it, then we can sell it. And so that's where the idea started from. Another thing that happened is as agriculture improved, uh, particularly in California, they started producing more food than people could eat, so they started freezing it so they could deliver it at different times of the year. Uh, Richard Pierrot from uh, Iowa State has, in some of the writings you probably will have read, uh, says that the average ingredient on your plate has traveled 1,500 miles to get to your table. And 6.3% of the retail cost is on transportation. And transporting that kind of food is 4 to 17 times more expensive than if you just buy local. The transport cost part. Okay, this is just, this is also from, this is actually from Michael Pollan. Uh, the average person eats almost 1,500 pounds of food a year. And you can see what it includes. Um, I thought this was an interesting slide taken uh, from about 2006 that of all the things we do in the day, which includes a little, you know, shopping and et cetera, two and a half hours a day watching TV is the average in the United States. And since I don't watch any, somebody's watching five hours out there. <laughs> I mean, so um, you just can't get a lot of exercise generally while you're watching TV. Uh, not unless someone's stolen it from your house and you're chasing them. Um, this is the book. I hope you had a chance to read it. It's a fascinating read. Um, uh, anybody you get to read it? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. Interesting story, wasn't it? I mean, some people don't like the little part about what's going on in their lives. They just want to get with the food issue. But I think it shows the stress of what it takes to have to live once you set out to do something like that. And I think they realize by the end, you don't have to be 100% that way, but you need to increase or promote that part of your life. And it's okay occasionally to have something from somewhere else, but that's just so that's not what you're always doing without thinking about it. So Alyssa and James, as you know, um, they found they were moving in the opposite direction. Most people, as we talked about, uh, she said she had the flu, uh, the dean, Laurie. Well, 
Yes, you get that from other people. But you know the diseases you get from food, people die from. I mean, and it's cantaloupes in California, and people are dead in North Carolina. I mean, there's, there's something wrong with that system. So it is, they found that they were moving away from the industrial grid into working with people they could trust in the market. Um, and you could talk to the people at the market. That's what I like best about going to the market, establishing a relationship with Bill Dow, who I assume you were talking about before, um, who was a pediatrician. Uh, and one of the founders, uh, I think even of the Carver market. Um, and he has dedicated his land. He has given his land in perpetuity to be preserved to be either as a, as a farm or something useful to the environment. Um, and one of their quotes in there is, we have an insane food system that's, that's totally based on cheap oil. And we do have cheap oil, you know. Um, another thing that was in the, the book was in 1893 on one island. It was like, I forget what it was. It was like six, 12 miles by 6 miles or something like that. I can't remember. And how much food they could produce on that one island in the middle of the godforsaken, you know, freezing cold rain all half the year area of the world. And it can be done. Um, and so it's really just a matter if you choose to do it. Food diversity, um, that's the other thing that's what happens when you stay away from local food where you're increasing diversity and people have local things that they like. Cream peas, who's had cream peas? Ah, a few people, okay. Brinkley makes those here. I don't know where you get those anywhere else. They're delicious. They're great. But it's something that they they keep, you know, they're able to, to make here uh, and grow and sell. But, you know, if it were a commercial variety, it just wouldn't happen. They're down to a few pea types all over that they can mass produce and get out. Whatever they can get the most from, you know, that's going to make the most profit, etc. I mean, it's just a business for them. I understand. It's okay. It's a business. I mean, I'm, I'm not faulting them for being good businessmen, but I'm not sure that's the best thing for you to eat. And um, the varieties of apples, um, Andrea Rusing, who spoke to our seeds banquet, actually brought apples, local apples. She's coming to class. She is? Weeks, yeah. Oh, good. She'll probably bring some more apples. <laughs> um, and she brought, um, she brought some apples and passed them out. And if you go to the mountains here, there are lots of places you can go where they're just apple, they're just trees growing because it was an old farmstead and they're apple trees. And they are delicious. They're hard. They're a bit, they got acid. They got a lot of oomph. It's like a, a red wine with a lot of tannin. I mean, you know you're eating something. A lot of those things that you buy in the store, I go mush in your mouth and you're, you know, wondering, why did I spend any money on that? And but unfortunately, when you go to commercial varieties, you lose a lot of that individuality. And the tomatoes I grow in my yard would never make it across. They barely make it into, you know, into my kitchen for five days. But they certainly wouldn't make it transcontinentally. The other thing I got out of that book is how much fun food was. They talk about making a pierogi. That was a great story. I don't, anybody made um, California rolls their own? It's a riot, and it's the best thing to do with a bunch of people who've got rice everywhere, you know. But eventually they learn how to do it. And I love making pasta and bread. It's like they're living. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, a bread that's, that's risen, and you push it, and it pushes back, you know. You just, I mean, if you push Wonder Bread, it doesn't push back. It's gone. Um, and so there's something about the, the different things they talked about inside inside the book that I think is just tremendous. It's your, it's your relationship with the food you're eating. It's kind of like I'm part American Indian and one of, in my heritage you respected the earth and you thanked even, you know, if you were eating an animal, I mean, that, that's something you do. And I think we need to get back to being closer, you know, to what we're doing. What about Sarah Dewart's, uh, the two articles? I thought hers was interesting with some facts in there. Talking about what really is local and what is organic, and is that good or bad? Uh, is a organically grown um, sea bass in Chile that's lived in a pen but fed all fed organically and then shipped to you is that 
and it's an organic, is that really what you want? Um, you know, and a lot of the discussion about the fuel that's used, not only in, for the food to get to you, but for a lot of the plants anyway, for the fertilizer and all the pesticide use to get to them. So um, there's a lot to think about in there about the actual cost of getting the food to you. Um, I mean, it's still amazing to me that we mine iron ore, we can ship it to Japan, they can make it into steel and come back, and it's cheaper than we can make steel here. And there's just something, there just boggles my mind. And as we're talking the same thing with food. The other thing is um, um, that ruminants uh, cause, some people say 17, some 18 of the greenhouse gas in the world. Um, I've been around a lot of cows. I didn't actually realize that at the time. I knew there were some bad odors, but I didn't. And of course, it's worse on what they're being fed rather than grass. Their stomachs weren't made to eat what they're eating. They were made to eat grass. Uh, they were, and when you alter their diet, uh, yeah, they grow fatter. Uh, and yes, there's more to, you know, meat to sell or there's more milk to sell, but they're also polluting the air doing it, so there is a cost. And she also says in there about food systems that drain your economies. Even if you're selling the food for a decent price, what it costs you in having to ship everything there to help you to grow the food, uh, plus you know, ship the food, et cetera, um, is, is, it, it's still, it's, an, it's negative balance for you. And the profits go basically to the transport people in the middle people and not to the farmers. Um, she also said spending money local has a multiplier effect because the more, you know, if I give you five dollars and you give it to him and to her, you know, the economy's moving, I'm, we're trading something for that five dollars and things are happening here and you're able to buy something, dinner, or whatever, just because you got the five dollars. And once we ship it out, it's gone and we don't see it back. And she says that by doing that, uh, you basically, communities will be healthier for a lot of ways, including a decrease in crime. All right, so here's, here's Andreas. Andreas Place, this is the lantern. Who's been to the lantern, anybody? All right. Um, Andrea's an amazing woman. Uh, I would say about one, every month, she's at the, farmer, far, the Carborough Farmer's Market doing something. Um, Shane from um, Foursquare is frequently at the Durham market, often where he does the tomato. He has all the tomatoes lined up and he's getting people to vote for what kind of tomatoes they like. So a lot of the local cooks, uh, Amy uh, Turnquist um, from Durham um, is, <laughs> when I go at seven o'clock to the, the market, she's already walking out with crates of blackberries or whatever, kale, whatever she's going to be cooking in a restaurant. So the, uh, the local cooks, a lot of them, uh, Ben Barker, uh, I've seen him there as well, uh, are buying local food. And they're, they're proud of it. Um, and they talk about it. So from Andrea's talk, is she responding or is she talking? Um, Charlie, she's responding to Will Allen. I okay, okay, good. Okay, I didn't want to take her if she were, okay. Um, she said in her talk to us that in 1985 there were 1,200 dairy farms in North Carolina. Today there's only 290. And basically the rest of this is describing at a critical moment, if we lose more farms, we'll also lose the support industries that support those farms and it'll be a self-perpetuating problem. So, you know, that's something to think about. There are more pigs in North Carolina than people. Okay? There are more pigs that are Tar Heels than people that are Tar Heels. Um, you ought to think about that. You know, if they had, if they had a vote, we would lose. Um, we used to have 3 million uh, pig farms in the U.S. We now have 85,000. Her recommendation, put one next to every barbecue joint. You know, just cut down the transportation costs. They can eat outside. You can see, you know, you go and pick a lobster, right? Well, well you're not going to quite pick the pig, but you know, you get the idea that you know where it came from, etc. Like that pig I showed you from uh, in Honduras. Everything 
that's available to us in the grocery stores has been manipulated as a product, resistant to pests, able to be shipped efficiently and or stored longer. When she asked in the produce department about lettuce or something, I can't remember what the subject was, the answer from the guy was, ma'am, we don't buy for taste, just color and appearance. So, and again, it's, it's a business. It's a business, but we have a, we have a, we have, we can choose where we want to go and eat. And so these are some of the other things she said, and I added a couple of things for, because I thought they would be useful. I, I know she meant it. Um, what if every Sunrise Biscuit used local eggs? That was one thing she talked about. If they just said, instead of buying eggs from elsewhere, that's one thing we're going to do. We're going to buy local eggs for our biscuits. Think of what that would do for the farmers in the local area. And again, the North Carolina barbecues lo use local pigs. You know, North Carolina barbecue, I mean, it's been sent in trucks. I mean, huge semi-trucks to Tennessee, to New York. If you talk to Mr. Allen from Allen and Sons, I mean, he'll tell you where he sent it. He's a character. Um, and he owns land everywhere. Do you know him? Yeah, he's probably, yeah. OK. Um, what if every restaurant used local greens? And most of our, the restaurants I told you about a minute ago, where we go, do use local greens. And Bill Dow's, what is it they always? Yeah. Arugula and something else. Huh? Yeah, there's some things Bill makes that everybody, I mean, they put on their Bill Dow's on it when they put it on the menu. He's a celebrity. Is he coming? He doesn't like to stand up in front of people, but he'd probably respond. Um, what about if every school used local milk? What if the Duke cafeteria, and I've talked to the guy that's running it now, by the way, I think he's receptive, he's young. He's receptive, he's not old like me. What if Duke cafeteria pledged to use 10, 15, or 20% local produce? What if that, you know, people say, what could you do? You know, well, you can't just switch everything to local. I mean, you can't do that. But you could make inroads, and you could have, you know, an assurance that people are going to try to move to more local things. And this would drive the agenda in town. Like I say, I think it's dri driven the, attendant, uh, the, uh, the agenda at Harris Teeter. And then maybe we get back to real food. So everyone's got an issue, right? Pigs and the cows. This, by the way, is what we had last Tuesday. And this was, pa this was a vegetable pate made with mushrooms and walnuts. It was outstanding. If I could have slipped one of those in my pocket and gone home, I would have done it. Um, That's the same person who's cooking for us tonight, and she's here. Are you here, Laura? I am. There she is. It was, <laughs> but you'll recognize the next one, too, then. So here's the bok choy. Um, and uh, she got white asparagus, Asian pear in there. Um, it's delicious. I mean, the food was just delicious, and I'm sure you're going to have a delicious meal. If you don't know what it is, here it is. I brought the menu for you. Uh, so this is what you're going to have tonight. Yeah, all local. This is an interesting place. It's a very fancy hotel in Quebec City, which I love. I just love this town. It's a great place. And in the middle of this very old, very famous hotel, they have their own spice garden, and they have chickens laying eggs. This is Quebec, you know, in the winter. I mean, if you could do that, when, we, when I drive to Quebec City, I go from Maine, which is like the north of north, cold, nothing but trees, nothing grows. I go across the border, and there's nothing but fields of wheat and stuff. Because to Canada, that's their southern edge. They grow everything there. They don't have any trouble at all. You know, it's, it's up here, folks. Where's this? Anybody know? Seattle, yes. Who are the people from Seattle? Or, yeah. Great place. I mean, if you want to get hit by a flying fish, this is the place to go. Because they love to do it as you walk by and they throw the fish from one person to the next. Um, 
But it's, it's the biggest inside market I've ever seen. Uh, and the Durham Farmers Market, who's been there? Excellent. Can you see that? That's seeds and tomatoes. And these are some of the kids. They're great kids, absolutely fantastic kids, proud of what they're doing. They love what they're doing. This is some of the local organic uh, vegetables. Carborough, Carborough's been around, the market's been around 35 years. Pretty long time. I love their tomato festival. I mean, you just want to die. <laughs> ah, they are so good. And, and the, the market has a lot of beef there. I mean, they, they've got animal products too that are all grown locally. I mean, that are raised locally. If you want a real hot dog, go to this guy. He makes all his own. He knows everything that goes in it. And it doesn't have all those other things to preserve it because it doesn't have to be preserved. He sells out every week. And this is Brinkley's uh, pork, frozen pork uh, cabinet. Makes some great garlic uh, uh, sausage. And the Durham Campus Farm, Emily. And these are some of her photos. Who's that in the middle? <clears throat> and some of the produce. I'm sorry, because when I blew it up, it gets a little blurry. But obviously, people having fun. They're close to their food, and they're having fun. Pretty sizable, huh? And seeds. Tell you a little bit about seeds, and then we can get on to... Okay, seeds... Um, as we already said, seeds was started in 1994 by Brenda and Anise. Um, the mission encourages respect for life, for the earth, and for each other. We help individual neighborhoods and communities grow together through gardening, gathering, and education, and help to start the Durham Farmers Market in 2000. Basically, the feeling in getting these kids involved is that the kids are disconnected from their food and sometimes their environment. And I don't know how many of you in this room felt that way until you even thought about this course or read some of the books I have here, etc. <clears throat> the skills they learn, um, we teach them to respect the earth and each other, but the skills they learn give them self-confidence and self-esteem. And they come out of this experience, they can stand up in front of this room and tell you about food. And they're, and they're just, they're transformed children. We grow plants and people. The Durham Inner City Gardeners, the dig crowd, are the older kids. They're the ones in high school. It empowers the teens by teaching them organic gardening, sound business practice. They have to go and sell it. Uh, and somehow, I mean, they can sell this stuff and they're calculating it all in their head. They're obviously smart kids. And they learn a lot about healthy food choices and food security. Uh, values. It, the program emphasizes sustainable living and growing, ecological balance, natural recycling of organic materials, and they're paid a stipend. Not much, but they're paid a stipend, <clears throat> and they, it's to both to be cultivators and, and gardeners and uh, sellers at the market. The seedlings are the young kids, the ones basically in primary school, uh, and it's to help them with their homework and tutoring, but also to engage them in the earth. And, it, and they learn basically a lot of the same things, maybe not the business part, that the dig kids do. And there's a program after school and a summer program that's during the day. Urban Earth is another one. Um, we have a guy who's fantastic who just teaches them what's in the soil, how soil is made, and how all the animals and critters in the soil you shouldn't run away from because they're helping to produce more soil. They're actually your friends. Um, you know, who in here like bats? Yeah. Bats, bats help you by eating their weight every day in insects. And this white mouth, this um, white nose disease in bats in the Northeast there's going to be a spread of mosquitoes and everything because the, mat, the bats are gone. We have to learn to live with these. There are things around us that are there for a reason, and we have to get over some of our little fetishes. I don't know if I'll convince my wife, but at any rate. Um, and plants used for food. The survival needs of plants, animals, and humans 
So they, they understand how it's all balanced together. One of the things they do every year is they pledge for a month not to eat soda or fast food. And then we bet money on whether they can do it or not. Uh, and the money is donated. They love it. And most of them don't go back. Or if they do, they realize they'll have a soda once a week and not two times a day. How many? Oh, I think it's on here. I'll ask the question in a second. All right, what's America's favorite topping? Pepperoni. This is some of the th questions the kids ask. What's the only food for human that never spoils? Honey. How many eggs does the average American eat in one year? 200. Americans eat approximately 100 acres of pizza each day. 350 slices per second. Is that enough? Is that good? Maybe if it's vegetarian pizza? I don't know. Honey. Okay, it takes 12 honeybees to produce one tablespoon of honey. 87 billion eggs are produced in the U.S. every year. That does include the ones that are, have to be grown to make the flu vaccine. Okay, this is Michael Pollan. Thank you, Brenda, for this photo. Uh, when he came and spoke at Seeds. Uh, and these are some of the things in some of the, th some of the things he's written that he talks about. One billion cans of Coke, the equivalent of one billion eight 12 ounce cans of a soft drink every day in the United States, which is an average of about three per person. And I can tell you some of the kids I treat drink a liter at a time. Um, 10 billion animals a year are slaughtered. Um, and it's the agro business uh, making decisions that are heavily invested in the business. Over 50% of the antibiotics are used in the United States are used in livestock. So if you can't get a prescription from your doctor, just go to the, you know, farmer's market, maybe. They, um, steroids and growth hormone are outlawed in athletes but are given to animals to bulk them up. Water and air pollution is rampant off of these large farms where they're just fertilizing like crazy. But basically, we're the victim of our lifestyle, which we have a choice over. Nobody's forcing us to, into McDonald's and saying you have to eat there. Uh, another thing he talks about is corn. Uh, what if you were the plant, the corn plant? And he says, basically, corn has used us to proliferate all over the world because we make ethanol, we make high fructose corn syrup, and we feed corn to animals that were never made to eat corn. So he thinks it's a conspiracy by corn. Well, I mean, he's saying that. I mean, we need to look at this from a different point of view. The, Earth, the atom bomb could have destroyed the planet but it didn't, at least not so far. Now we are do, doing it incrementally with greenhouse gas. Oil was produced from diatoms over millions of years <clears throat> that we'll use up in a century. That's all the oil that's in the ground. At the rate we are going, the Earth will have the world back to itself and maybe be happy, you know, that get rid of us is, you know, because we're not doing such a good job taking care of it. And we need to respect the Earth and live with it. To end, I've just got some slides here of the seeds garden. That's uh, obviously, you can see the greenhouse and a couple of the raised beds. This is the south side garden here. There's the Garden of Eden uh, up at the, up at the uh, farmer's market. Uh, these are kids just having a great time working with the earth. You can see they love it. That's lettuce, folks. And carrots. You know, a lot of them, where? You pull a carrot out of the ground. Jeez, how'd you get that? You know, I mean, where'd that come from? And we do arts, art grows every year is a, one of the things we do, which, you know, gets people to come in and uh, do some art, sell some artistic things. But they, it allows them to go through the garden and see the garden. This is the tomato plant idea of what's going on. This is a Saturday when all the kids are there working. Here they are playing with the earth and with the plant, the greenhouse. So what can we do about this problem? We can educate our children. We can educate ourselves. We can demand that we increase our local food options, take our time and respect the food we eat, and slow down and enjoy our food. Um, I have here, this arrived at 
3 o'clock. Every week I get one of these. These are from local manufacturers. So what's this? Collars. Excellent. Hey, all right. We're doing okay here. Cabbage. We got, uh, here's some arugula. It's hard to see. Can you see those? Yeah. So it's possible, even in the winter, to have, if you can't grow it all yourself, local food. And we have a co-op at Global Health Institute, which uh, allows us to get a cut a price, a cut price on the delivery, like almost nothing, because they can deliver it all at one place. So I thought since I got that on my way out the door today, I'd just bring it along and show you that you can eat local. Thanks very much. Do you want this or do? Thank you, Dennis. That was a great overview of how um, agriculture has changed in the um, last 50 years. And um, Wendell Berry said it best. He said, eating is an agricultural act. He said, we have a food system that doesn't care about health and a health system that doesn't care about food. And um, Carlo Petrini, who is um, another um, important figure, is the founder of the slow food movement. And I know Andrea, when she comes, she'll talk more about the slow food movement. Um, it actually started when they were going to put a McDonald's up at, at the Spanish Steps in Rome. And uh, Carlo, who is a philosopher and um, local politician that just got his friends and they all protested and they formed um, the slow food movement which is another possibility for you all on campus because slow food now has a slow food on campus you, there are 40 chapters across the US so that's that's a possibility that you all could do uh, they believe in food that is good clean and fair so there's food justice issues. The food must be sustainably produced in ways that are sensitive to the environment. And those who produce must be fairly treated. And it must be healthy and delicious. And um, he formed this organization in 1986. And since then, um, they have another group called Terra Madre. And over 80,000 people from all over the world go to Italy and they bring their food heritage with them. And Andrea was one of the speakers right after Carlo and Alice Waters because she was the head of our local convivia. And um, so um, these people are preserving traditions. They are keeping the diversity of heritage breeds and um, special ways of taking and cooking food. And um, natives around the world feed themselves without making use of the harmful methods of the industrial complex. And um, Alice Waters is the vice president of this organization. She came to Seeds when we had our 10th anniversary. And uh, she just said it best that when children plant the seed, and they grow it, and then they harvest it and cook it, they'll eat it. There's buy-in. All those steps make it possible. And um, she has um, her edible schoolyard is um, really providing education across the US. And SEEDS is doing much the same thing, and our youth on Saturdays when they come back from the farmer's market, they, um, they cook what they have harvested that day and perhaps didn't sell. 
And SEEDS has had a lot of fun. We have had some adjacencies. Um, Dennis alluded to one of them, and that was the farmer's market. We started the first farmer's market. It was just about four or five vendors. But then as, as we saw that it was a growing interest, we collaborated with Durham uh, Central Park and the Self-Help Credit Union, and we got the pavilion built, and now we have over 60 vendors. And uh, the Seeds Youth are the only nonprofit selling there, and they, they are proud to be part of that. Um, <clears throat> Carlo Petrini, uh, the Slow Food um, guru who came to Raleigh a few years ago, he said, farmers are the true intellectuals. You can't eat computers. <laughs> so, um, and Barbara Kingsolver, I, I saw that book was on your list, alludes to, I, I, if you got to the end, she alludes to um, uh, seeds, and when she left, she gave us her honorarium, which was very nice because it takes money to run a nonprofit. It wasn't just the fourth graders, as it turned out. The whole school was lucky, along with three other elementary schools in our county. School garden programs have lately begun showing up in schools from the trend-setting Bay Area to working-class Durham, North Carolina. Alice Waters founded the Berkeley programs, developing a curriculum that teaches kids, alongside their math and reading, how to plant gardens, prepare school lunches, and eat them in a civil manner. She has provided inspiration nationwide to improve food in school cafeterias. And she also came um, here about, I guess it was in 2006, for the combined UNC Duke Literary Festival, and she talked about her book, and and um, she was very cute because she said that um, she didn't want to leave her turkeys because the eggs were getting ready to hatch, and she had signed up a year ahead, and here she was speaking in this magnificent chapel, and she said she didn't mention turkeys once, but when she got home, they rushed right to where the turkeys were, and the hen was, um, the turkey was there, and she picked out an egg, and it just open and cracked in her hand, and she had a baby turkey in her hand, and she, that it's very sweet the way she moves and talks about that. And Seeds did the same thing. Hens had been um, um, banned in Durham, and so we had a great exercise for children, the youth in, in um, government, because we got a petition of 1,200 names, and then we began talking to the city council and working with the, the city workers, and eventually we turned the ordinance. We created an ordinance, and now you can have hens in the city. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> and so I, I was one of the first people to get hens. <laughs> They're Sophie. <laughs> And then the Duke uh, Seeds also had fun because the Duke um, Smart Home started a garden and called in local gardeners to give advice. And so Seeds was part of that, and that's how I met Emily, who thought even bigger and moved on to the farm, which is really awesome. So um, I'm going to let Emily tell you about that. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Emily Sloss. I'm the farm manager of the Duke Campus Farm. Um, how many of you here have heard about the farm before this class? How many of you have been to the farm? Good. That's the most that I've seen in a class before, but there are about 100 of you. So um, how many of you have eaten food from the dining halls that came from the farm? How many of you know it's there? <laughs> um, so that's one of our biggest uh, hurdles is getting the word out that we're here, uh, that we exist, and that we want you all to be involved uh, with this project. So the Duke Farm started, um, it was just an idea two years ago uh, today. Two years ago I was sitting in a class much like you all in Charlotte Clark's food and energy class uh, thinking that, you know, food was interesting and I wanted to learn more about it, um, but it wasn't something that 
had profan profoundly affected my life uh, in a way that it has now. Um, and now two years later, it seems like every minute of my day is either spent growing food or cooking food or, or eating food. Um, so it's been quite quite a change. Um, but from the from the Duke student perspective, as a student, I was, you know, I ate in the cafeterias and the dining halls, but I was really too busy to ever think about too much of the, the impacts and the, the effects of, of my food choices. Um, but hope, but now, more and more every semester, it seems like there are more students um, and staff faculty that seem to place this as a really important issue um, and are seeking to learn more about it and to actually take part in it in their own food choices. Um, so a little bit about my background. I uh, come from a family of conventional cattle farmers in western Iowa. In uh, fact, all my family except my parents are, are cattle farmers, so they're very, very confused as to what I'm doing here in the organics. Um, my grandfather recently called me a Christian scientist because he says I have rejected all the marvels of modern medicine to follow the religion of organics. Um, so <laughs> this whole journey into sustainable farming has been a very personal uh, journey, as food should be, um, particularly for me having to deal with the very real uh, past of my family and their expectations as to you know what a real business is and what real farming is. Um, it also has highlighted a lot of the inconsistency and contradictions that the food system has. Um, so I spent a lot of my summers growing up um, at the family farm in Iowa. And the, by definition, the farm is a family farm because it's run by my uncles and cousins. Um, but it is the largest feedlot in the state with 13,000 head of cattle. Um, so we keep hearing that family farms are disappearing and things like that. Um, and they are. This is all true. But it's also the lines of blurred of when corporations take over and when there's still small families actually running big operations like this that have had to get big to stay, stay in the game. Um, some of the other contradictions were that we were in the breadbasket of America, some of the most fertile soil in the world. And for, you know, as far as I could see, there was cornfields around us, but you couldn't actually eat the corn. It took years for me to understand that you couldn't eat field corn, though that was for animals, it wasn't for humans. I mean, I tried it a few times, and that didn't end well, because um, it's just not edible. Um, but even making that simple connection as to, you know, why, why are we here? Why are we in this, this place where we can grow all this food, but you can't actually go into the garden and, and eat any of it? Um, my grandmother gave up her kitchen garden after a while because the, the spray drift from the, the, the fields just killed her, her garden every time. So she just decided she's not gonna, she's not gonna do it anymore. Um, so when my parents became of age, they moved as far away as possible from Iowa to Florida to give their children a different lifestyle. Um, and then I promptly went back to that. So um, there's certainly some humor in it, but there's also a certain kind of frustration of learn like realizing that there's been an entire generation of information lost. Um, I had to start from scratch. I have had no formal agricultural background or training. Uh, I manage a one acre sustainable farm right now, but everything I've learned, I've learned by doing or by reading or by you know, going to workshops within the past year. Um, but it's not that hard, it's not rocket science. It's uh, one of the most basic acts that we as humans can do. Um, and it shouldn't even really be called a skill because you just have to put in the ground a seed and pay some attention to it. Um, but anyways, at the Duke Farm, we um, are really excited uh, how far we've come and how much support we've gotten from the university and, and how invested uh, Duke students and faculty and staff seem to be in learning more about where the food comes from and why it's so important. Uh, so we have two missions at the farm. One is to produce and sell local organic food to the dining halls to increase access to the, the dining halls. And th so we sell to Marketplace and to the Great Hall, which they do have a commitment to source at least 10% of their food locally, um, which is great. And that's 
you know, a claim that few universities of our size and, and, and status can make. Uh, our other goal is to um, provide an educational facility around food to the Duke and Durham community. And so we do that by having weekly community work days and giving people an opportunity to get out there and really learn about where the food is coming from. People, one of the most common questions I get out at the farm is, are you organic, are you certified? Um, we aren't and we never will be. And that's because, you know, that certification is just people asking, or it's a way of branding your, your product and saying it's grown with these certain standards. But, you know, if you want to know how your food is grown, that you're eating every day in the dining halls, you have an incredible opportunity to just come out to the farm on the weekends and see for yourself. And you don't even have to wonder, like, what are, you know, what pesticides are being used. Um, there aren't any. Um, so that's been neat. And then our food miles are, are six. It's six miles to the farm. Um, you could run there if you're ambitious. So, um, <laughs> um, and even that is big for us. I mean, ideally, it would have been, you know, right on the, the chapel quad, but Duke Landscape wasn't too excited about that. Or maybe someday. Um, but anyways, Duke is making great strides forward with their food and sustainability, and we're really excited about that. But we still have a really long ways to go. This is just the beginning. And the college age is a really critical time because this is when you make a lot of your, you know, your personal life choices or your habits about how you're going to live your own life. But also, uh, it's a time when you decide what your career path will be and, and the values that you want to represent in the world. So um, we hope food is important to you all. And if you want to learn more, we hope you to see you at the farm. So thank you. What kinds of um, rights are being <coughs> granted or guaranteed to migrant farmers in the local scene? And I suspect you mean both the local and industrial scene, um, what's happening with migrant farmers. And if somebody wants to give a quick answer, I'm happy to entertain that. We have a whole week on this subject. Um, so any, anything quick? Yeah. Well, the local farmers and farmers markets are giving them how do we how do we how do we guarantee that is there laws or someone overseeing it or how are we there there are um, there are some laws. Okay, okay. So yeah. there is one Linda, yeah. one concept yeah. that you can keep in mind and begin to to look at is uh, there we have labels for local, we have labels for sustainable and various ingredients and so forth. There is a movement to work for a label. Other questions or thoughts? Yes. Uh, aside from selling the food, 
aside from selling your food, do you get money elsewhere? At this point, no. I mean, well, we are subject to the university, but we pay back as well. They give us five dollars. Yeah, so the university subsidizing, but you're paying back by giving the university food, right? right. Yeah. So, but they would welcome gifts. Two more, one, two. So the question is both for campus farm and for seeds, do you integrate animals? in the back row. <laughs> um, one more. just rehearse what's going to happen now. You're going to find your small groups if you don't know where they are. There's lists outside that will show you. Find your name and your small group leader. Let's just randomly start with Cynthia's group in case, in case everyone gets up there and I'm not up there quite yet. So Cynthia's group eats first and Kate's group eats second. And then by the time those two are done, either Charlie or I will be up there to sort of organize it. Um, and our speakers, I think, are staying for dinner. So if you have questions or want to speak with them further, please come up and walk them upstairs. Thanks. See you in a minute.